I'm going to sit here because I am going to try to do this in 15 minutes max. I'm going to hold myself to that uh, so that we can spend the balance of this session taking all your questions and having a discussion together. Um, so I want to start off, first of all, by again saying thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this forum, both last night and uh, today. I, I've just been curious, how many people were here last night? Oh, good. I was right not to give the same speech, even though it was very <laughs> compelling to me. Uh, 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 but Wendy's uh, remarks this morning really did make me want to reemphasize the fact that as we closed the commission down, we did create a lasting legacy. And uh, there's a funny little side story to this, by the way. The people at the National Archives were wonderful, very cooperative. But one of the things we found out is we had this vision of not only a written report, but an electronic report, and then a website that would contain all the documents, for example, that are footnotes in our report, so people could go to the original document, whether it was the Federal Reserve Examination Report, or the Goldman Sachs memo, or the AIG response to that memo. Uh, we had this vision of having audio recordings available in perpetuity, video of our hearings, and what we found is that the National Archives, they can do none of that. They can give you a frozen website. So if you go look at the 9-11 website, you'll see a series of frozen pages. And so graciously, Stanford University, the Rock Center on Corporate Governance, agreed to house our website where you can find our report. You can find about 2,000 documents, I believe about which 12 or 1,300 um, are, are the documents actually referred to in our report. And you can find the audio, uh, of, of, I think, about 400 plus interviews as well the, as the video of all our uh, hearings. And I believe it's a rich treasure trove of information. Fascinating, interesting, a lot of uh, looks at the nooks and crannies of this crisis. And I might add, uh, to the extent that there has been fury from the financial sector about a report, I think a lot of it has to go, go to the fact that we deliberately decided not to aid and abet but rather in the interest of the public to release documentation that we really believed was in the public interest. And there was tremendous resistance to that notion. And as it turns out, uh, we didn't see our job to help defendants in civil litigation. We didn't see our jobs to aid civil litigation. But as it turns out, in many of the private rights of action that are occurring across this country today, the documentation that we released are seminal documents in that litigation. And just as a footnote to something I said last night, which is about the, um, uh, the concerns about the last lack of investigatory and prosecutorial zeal and resources in the wake of this crisis, I, I think it's worthy to note that while uh, federal and state agencies may have been slow off the mark, uh, the private bar in this country has been very aggressive. And, for example, there's about 90 significant private rights of action seeking about $200 billion in damages with respect to mortgage origination and securitization practices alone that are going forward. This morning, I thought I would uh, focus in my few minutes just on a couple of uh, pieces of what I talked about last night. I want to re-emphasize, I think, in a different slant, something that Wendy said at the end. Um, which is much of what we allowed to occur, we allowed to occur. This notion of self-regulation, uh, this notion of complexity that was built as innovation, I think Paul Volcker probably put it right, which, in which he said that the only real innovation in recent history in the financial sector was the creation of the ATM. But we, um, she listed a set of factors that in many respects were known in the marketplace, and I don't think it's a mistake that the first chapter of our report to the nation was called Before Our Very Eyes, because much of what happened happened in front of us, was allowed to occur. Uh, and I want to talk just for a moment about this issue of avoidability that I touched on last night, because I think it is critical to avoiding the next crisis. And the second thing I'd like to do is speak pretty briefly about the role of federal housing policy, particularly the role of the Community Reinvestment Act, of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which, not to be forgotten, were private, publicly traded corporations, ultimately too big to fail corporations like their brethren uh, on Wall Street. But uh, federal housing policy, the role of the CRA, the role of Fannie and Freddie, have become a rallying cry for a whole set of people from Wall Street to Washington 
uh, as an alternative explanation for this crisis. And being, uh, someone referred to it once as the zombie lie phenomenon. No matter how many facts are put on the table, the argument continues to come back. And now it is achieving, again, a uh, measure of political prominence. Every major Republican candidate for president embraces the explanation that it was federal housing policy that drove us over the cliff. And Michael Bloomberg, the other day in which he made one of his periodic criticisms of Occupy Wall Street, uh, noted that he thought that the wrong people were being vilified. It wasn't the banks who did this. It was the Congress of the United States who pushed banks to do what they did and pushed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, as I said last night, we had six key findings. The first was that this crisis was avoidable. The second, that there were widespread failures of financial regulation, both gaps in regulation and the unwillingness and the lack of political will to enforce the very ample regulations that were in place. We found dramatic breakdowns of corporate governance, excessive leverage uh, and risk throughout the whole system. Uh, we found policymakers who were ill-prepared to deal with the crisis as it came upon us because of their lack of the full understanding of the risk that has met, had metastasized throughout the system. And finally, consistent with a lot of the work that Bill Black and others have done in this room, we found widespread breaches of ethics, accountability, yes, and a system that was rife with fraud. Uh, I want to talk just for a minute about, about, about this notion of avoidability because it's still contested by many people. And I will just say that uh, what Wendy said is right. We knew a lot about what was happening, and there had been a widespread belief that this was the new paradigm, the new marketplace. I remember when I first uh, was elected treasurer of the state of California, very early on in my tenure uh, as a trustee of the California Public Employees Retirement System, the largest pension fund in the world, we had a set of experts come before us who told us we had now entered the new cycleless economy. I knew right then, right at that moment, that we were heading towards another cataclysm. There was a hubris that had infected the marketplace about uh, your ability to calibrate all risk and to control them. Not to understand the herd instinct nature of the marketplace, the fact that as Wendy's chart showed, you could be at Bear Stearns and start the week with $14 billion of liquidity, and by the end of the week, have zero. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was a Columbia, was it uh, Emmanuel? One person noted that, look, you can model gravity, because whether a rocket's going up or a rocket's going down, gravity is still a constant force, but you can't mark, you cannot model markets in the same sense. So there was a hubris that infected the market, but also let's be clear about what was happening. People were late making lots of money under this system, but let me be more accurate. They were booking significant profits. That's not the same as making a lot of money. They were booking enormous profits based on their activities. They were valuing assets at, at values that really weren't sustainable or real. And the outcome of that was, by booking enormous profits, they paid enormous compensation and on an immediate basis benefited greatly from this boom. And if you look at the major financial institutions, unlike most corporations in America, they are very much compensation driven. They pay out about 50% of their profits in compensation. Um, this notion that no one could have seen it coming, I just have to point out a few things here and I just, I don't want to read you our book, but there was an explosion as we know in risky subprime lending and securitization. Richard Breeden, who was George H.W. Bush's chairman of the SEC, I think put it very well. He said, quote, everyone in the whole world knew that the mortgage bubble was there. I mean, it wasn't hidden. You cannot look at any of this and say that the regulators did their jobs. This was not some hidden problem. It wasn't on Mars or Pluto or somewhere. It was right here. You can't make trillions of dollars of mortgages and not have people notice. As I mentioned last night, in 2005, the Fed received a whole set of reports on the condition of the housing market. And one uh, Federal Reserve staffer uh, did work that showed that uh, by that time period, 59% of the originations at Countrywide were quote unquote non-traditional mortgages, moving away from 30-year fixed mortgages to interest only, low teaser rates, 
payment option arms that had negative amortization. 58% of the loans at Wells Fargo had those characteristics. 51% at National City. 31% at Washington Mutual. It was pervasive across the marketplace, yet no action was taken. Even once the market began to head down, the Wall Street market continued to create mortgages and to securitize them. Uh, starting in the third quarter of 2006, and really housing prices started to move down in about the spring of 2006 nationally, earlier in other places like my hometown of Sacramento in the fall of 2005, even after the clear downtrend in housing prices because so many of these products were predicated on ever-rising prices, what happened on Wall Street? Wall Street investment banks created and sold another $1.3 trillion of mortgage-backed securities and $350 billion of mortgage-related collateralized debt obligations. I think one of the most striking facts that I came across in this whole uh, crisis was not something that required investigation, but rather that this simple fact, home prices, uh, excuse me, home, the home ownership rate, remember most of this was done in the name of home ownership, the home ownership rate in this country peaked in April of 2004 the most egregious lending practices, the damage done to our economy in the name of quote-unquote home ownership from 2005 to 2007 didn't add one homeowner to the ranks of home ownership in this country. Uh, going down very quickly, kind of other facts and evidence, just by way of example, this notion that there wasn't a great knowledge of the predatory lending practices that were occurring in the country. There's a fascinating Columbia Journalism Review uh, article, which was actually sent to me by Wendy's husband, who is, a, as some of you may know, is a very well-known uh, Kansas City native who wrote a great book called What's the Matter with Kansas? Uh, but he sent me an article from the Columbia Journalism Review, um, and it was about how the media covered the crisis and did they see it coming. And there's an interesting piece of this that says that between 2000 and 2003, there was an enormous amount of coverage all across the country about predatory lending practices and the boiler rooms that were set up by the most aggressive lenders like AmeriQuest. But in 2003, all the stories disappear because those were all stories about what was happening at the local level and what local law enforcement and state attorney generals were doing to try to clamp down. What happened in 2003 that made this story go away. The federal government moved in, stopped the states from enforcing predatory and unfair lending practices against national banks. All the local stories of abuses and enforcement went away, and the federal government tied the hands of the local enforcement entities and then sat on their own hands. But the fact that this was going on was not a secret. In 2000, Secretary of uh, HUD, Andrew Cuomo, along with Larry Summers, convened a joint uh, task force on predatory lending and, lending and found, quote, patterns of abusive practices reporting, quote, substantial evidence of too frequent abuses in the subprime lending market. As Bill has mentioned before, as I mentioned last night, the FBI in 2004 began issuing consistent warnings about the level of fraud the number of suspicious activity reports, which are bank required reports about transfers of money that uh, look like they could in fact be criminal in nature related to mortgages, uh, doubled from 2005 to 2007. Uh, the evidence was there and I might add what was being reported was just the tip of the iceberg because first of all two-thirds of the institutions in this country, the most egreg uh, egregious, aggressive lenders weren't even subject to those reporting requirements, the AmeriQuest of the world, the New Centuries of the world. But for example, at Countrywide, their own internal reports showed potentially fraudulent loans of about uh, 5,000 in 2005, 10,000 in 2006, and 20,000 in 2007. And they reported potentially fraudulent loans to the government, uh, 855 in 2005, 2,800 in 2006, and 2,600 in 2007. All across the marketplace, the warning signs were there. And let me just end with this one final example. Because this notion that, uh, that no one could see it coming is complete bunk. Take a look at the derivatives market alone. In 1994, Orange County 
uh, undertakes the greatest municipal bankruptcy in history until Jefferson County this week. By the way, also derivatives driven. Um, in the wake of that, there's a whole set of other scandals at Procter & Gamble, at Gibson Greeting Cards, at Sumitomo Corporation. And then in September of 1998, there's an explosion. Long-term capital management that is enormously leveraged, levered, that has made enormous bets on foreign currency, uh, collapses. The Fed, Federal Reserve engineers a rescue. This is kind of one of the first warning bells of systemic risk interconnection, because if they go down, the impact of major financial institutions will be great. So at that point, you would think that any rational set of decision makers would say, given the wave of what's happened, we better look at the derivatives market. In May of that same year, four months before long-term capital management implodes, Brooksley Bourne, one of our fellow commissioners, head of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, has the temerity to put out a concept paper discussing the efficacy of regulating over-the-counter derivatives. She is immediately shut down by Robert Rubin, Larry Summers, Arthur Levitt, all the powerful boys in Washington. But when long-term capital management happens, you would think that people would say, you know what, Brooksley's got a point. We better look into this. But what happens instead? What happens instead is the Congress of the United States immediately passes a moratorium on the ability of the Commodities Future Trading Commission to proceed along with its consideration of the regulation of derivatives. And two years later, in 2000, they shut the door completely. An example of what we knew and the powers that stopped us from doing the right thing for our country. So I think the case is pretty clear that it was known and it was deliberate. And, and the reason this avoidability issue, I think, is so seminal is the following. The greatest tragedy would be to accept this notion that no one could have seen this coming and thus nothing could have been done. If we accept this, I can guarantee you what has happened to this country will happen again. Uh, now, let me just talk. Okay, I went over. I lied, but not as big as her. Um, let me just talk very briefly. I'm going to do this by 937, 8. And we can. Uh, 39. I, I do want to just touch on it, and then we can open questions. In the wake of our report, there's been a very aggressive assault on our work. And I might point out, as I did last night, no one has yet found a factual error in this report. Uh, to date, I mean, the closest we came is Goldman Sachs sent out three kind of third party uh, spokespeople to question some of Chris's excellent work about the fact, you know, Goldman's always claimed that all the money they got through the AIG bailout flowed to them and then to other people. And we found, I think, about $1.9 billion that, in fact, stayed right in their pockets. They sent some people out to do a little disruption, but if they really knew it was untrue, trust me, they would have had their whole fleet out there. But notwithstanding the factual accuracy, there's been a constant assault on this report. Um, and I might add, with a lot of congressional Republicans in tow, uh, when the report uh, uh, process concluded, uh, I will tell all of you, it really, it's been publicly known, but the, for the next six months, Daryl Issa, who uh, heads the House uh, Government Oversight Committee, conducted an investigation into our work, which I thought was a very troubling, chilling phenomenon, that a commission duly constituted by the Congress of the United States was then subject to a full-scale investigation, the review of a half a million emails, all with the purpose of trying to find the email where I told Wendy, don't look at the Community Reinvestment Act. Don't look at this. Don't look at that. And in six months, they found nothing. At least they found nothing with respect to the majority commissioners and the staff. But, you know, the fact is that like the uh, attack on the climate scientists, where you look at the work of thousands of people and you find four emails, that's the purpose. And there's also a phenomenon here when it comes to Fannie, Freddie, and the CRA that's not unlike what happened right around the Iraq war. If you say Al-Qaeda and Iraq enough in the same sentence, it slowly begins to permeate people's consciousness. Now, the fact is that we came into this inquiry without bias with respect to the impact of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the CRA. And I can tell you that from my own perspective. And we devoted enormous resources to looking at this question because we knew it was such a central point of debate. And if you look at our report, 
Uh, the government-sponsored agencies, uh, enterprises, Fannie and Freddie are mentioned 760 times in our report, over 92 pages. We released 140 documents. And in the end, while we acknowledge that they were disasters, they used their political clout, uh, just like Wall Street firms did, to ward off effective regulation. They had a business model in which the profits were privatized and the losses were socialized. They were the kings of leverage. They were leveraged at 75 to 1. Um, they jumped into this marketplace, subprime and alt-day lending, just as the market was peaking to regain market share, to meet investors and analysts' expectations for growth, and to ensure lavish compensations for the executives, just like their Wall Street brethren. The fact is that while they obviously participated in this debacle, the data shows, the data shows that they were not the driving force. First of all, uh, while they participated in the expansion of subprime lending, all the data shows that they followed rather than led Wall Street. By uh, 2003, their, uh, their market share had shrunk to, uh, excuse me, by 2006, their market share had shrunk to 37%. And from that point on, they raced uh, mightily to try to catch up in search of profits. Uh, they did participate in purchasing subprime securities, but they never represented a majority. The private sector gobbled up the lion's share of those securities. As Wendy noted, we uh, uh, reviewed, uh, analyzed 25 million loans and the default rates between the Loans securitized by Wall Street and by Fannie and Freddie had very different results. Even if you take a similar borrower, a borrower with a 660 credit score, uh, the default rates for Wall Street securitized loans by the end of 2008 was, was about 28.3%. For Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, it was 6.3%. And finally, there's this simple fact, which Wendy walked into my office one night at 3 a.m. after a year plus of investigation and pointed out to me. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac didn't cause a crisis in this respect. As you remember, this crisis really begins to unfold in 2007 as the value of, as people realize how defective subprime mortgages are. At which point, the value of subprime mortgage security starts cascading downward. But because of the implicit federal guarantee for Fannie and Freddie securities, those prices never drop. So all the losses that happened at Bear Stearns, at Citigroup, and at Merrill, and all the big institutions that rocked the system in 2007 were caused by the private label non-Fannie, non-Freddie securities. Not to say that they were good participants, but they did not cause the cascading losses that brought down this system. I mention this tonight, though, because this is a story that will not die. And let me just add the final two things on this. Nine of ten commissioners agreed that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were not the central cause of this crisis. That's five Democrats, one independent, three Republicans. One did not. He came in with a view, and he exited on the last day with a view. With respect to the Community Reinvestment Act, initially enacted as an anti-redlining statute, in a period when banks wiped out whole areas and wouldn't even consider extending credit into those areas. Again, nine of 10 commissioners, five Democrats, one independent, three Republicans, found that the data did not support that the Community Reinvestment Act was in any way a significant factor in this crisis because of the performance of those loans and the small percentage of loans that were subject to that act. Remember that AmeriQuest, a new century, and all the most aggressive subprime lenders were not even subject to the Community Reinvestment Act. But the debate is not over, and I suspect it will not be, because there are very, very serious attempts to deflect attention away from the real causes of this crisis. Now, I will admit this, and I think we need to note this. There were failures of federal housing policy. There was the rhetoric of home ownership and opportunity. And where policymakers failed is they did not ensure that the strong and positive rhetoric of responsibly extending credit was matched with the harsh realities of what was happening on the ground. They turned a blind eye to the crude and egregious practices that were disrupting communities, families, and our marketplace. And that is a dramatic failure of housing policy. When the homeownership rate peaks in April of 2004, 
and the government allows the kind of practices that happened after that in the name of home ownership, there's plenty to blame to go around in Washington for allowing that to occur. So those are two points I wanted to make, and my recommendations about where we need to go are still there. We need justice. We need reform. We need to fix our housing market by reducing principal and resetting the clock. And finally, we need to build an economy where capital is deployed to build enterprises, jobs, and wealth, not just as a device for speculation. Thank you. Same. We yeah. said it quick. And we have four minutes for questions? No, we have a little more. <laughs> Don't we have a little more than that? No, we have yeah, ten. Okay. Let's go, guys. Is that a microphone? I'm willing to proceed with that one. You're going to have to continue with that. All right. Um, did you find any evidence that the financial industry corporations were behind the federal policy with regard to the mortgages? and? in terms of helping to expand the mortgage business. The marketplace deliberately pushed federal policy to open the door even wider. Now, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were not federal agencies. I mean, they, you know, there's an interesting little side story. Fannie Mae was a federal agency until 1968. It was created during the Depression uh, by Franklin Roosevelt to create liquidity in the mortgage market. It was a federal agency. Johnson wanted to move it off the books of the, of the budget because during the Vietnam War, the deficit was growing and the liabilities of Fannie Mae showed up on the budget. So he said, get it off of here. And that was really the genesis of this profit-making enterprise with a public mission. But for example, uh, what you'll read in our report is that uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, were slow to the game as the most pernicious form of subprime lending took hold in the marketplace, they wouldn't buy the mortgages. So, for example, Angelo Mozilla, countrywide, began to aggressively push them to do more. Uh, uh, he, uh, I think in about, and Chris can remember the numbers, probably 2002, 2000, no, 2002 2003, uh, uh, Fannie was buying, what, 72% of Countrywide's mortgages. But by 2005, they were buying, what, 28%? Much lower. Huh? Much lower. Much lower. And so in other words, they, the, and so what was happening is they were pushing Fannie and Freddie to do more, to buy more of the, of the riskier stuff. So, I, so they were in there trying to open up those channels, I think it's fair to say. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. I wonder if there isn't another way of looking at this, uh, which is in terms of a series of financial crises that occur repeatedly unless the government stops. So if you go back before the Depression, you see the financial panics in 1907, the stock market crash in 1909. And less well-known the story Bill likes to tell, the subprime crisis of 1991. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so that whenever we had a largely unregulated market, you see the same kinds of predatory lending practices creating bubbles that then expand until there is a crash. And that the story that isn't being told is how government intervention stopped them after 1933. And so very quickly, and then Wendy will have a comment. David Moss, who's a professor at Harvard Business School, of course, has a great chart, and he, and he actually has some correlations in the chart in which he shows kind of levels of bank failure, and they are stunningly, of course, correlated to when you had uh, pretty strong regulatory regimes and when you didn't. And obviously you see the huge spike in the wake of the 1929 uh, crash. You see the huge spike in the wake of the deregulation of the SNLs. And the history of this country were actually all through the 19th century uh, until the creation of the Federal Reserve and then the creation of the, of, uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance and Glass-Steagall and the set of reforms. You see regularly financial crises that occur 
And of course, what happened, particularly since 1980, is this parallel banking system, bigger than the regular banking system grow up that Wendy referred to without a regulatory framework. And it's a pretty consistently repeated story. By the way, Art Will, Martha, I know is speaking later today. He did work with us. I learned an immense amount from him. I actually, just as a layperson, had forgotten, didn't know the extent of regular bailouts of financial institutions in the same pattern. I think, you know, as Chris noted, as always, it's aggressive growth, it's enormous risk, and then, of course, the fall and the public intervention to stabilize. Final question for this session. Did you have any idea? Well, ideology. Yeah, I, well, I do think ideology, how a country looks at its uh, public institutions and the protection of the common welfare is important. And on that score, we're, we're not in the most positive cycle. So let's start there. I mean, and, and I mean that in the largest sense. I mean, the ethos of the commonwealth has eroded significantly, and that does affect the strength, the political will, the capabilities of people in public regulatory functions. I think there's also some even more direct um, problems. And, and it's something that at the end of one of our hearings I talked to uh, Chairman Bernanke about. One of the things I saw was um, the number of people when we would interview them and come across, you know, hundreds of people had been in the financial sector, the number of people who were kind of uh, in regulatory agencies out of law school or out of uh, graduate school, they were there for three or four years, it was kind of three or four years and out. Uh, I think two phenomenon, um, you know, the lack of kind of, res the lack of respect and where we hold public service in our society, not to be too nostalgic here, but when I came out of college in 1974, in my dorm there were not a fleet of people anxious to be investment bankers. People wanted to be doctors, they wanted to be in public service, and so the ethos does matter. But also, and I don't think government can compete, but this pay scale differential, is enormous. And I do think if you want good, talented people to be in the public service, you not only need to reward that, in other words, empower them, uh, give them the ability to make judgments, stand behind them with political will, but you need to give them levels of compensation that will never equate to what's happening in the private sector, but it at least will give a larger set of people uh, the ability to make that a career without extraordinary sacrifice. I mean, the truth is, Wall Street, they're like a greased pig. They move fast, and, and they're hard to catch. So you need people of talent. The second thing I would say, though, is I don't think we can be wholly reliant on uh, the regulatory system to catch problems in advance. Well, you know, testimony we got from regulators say, gee, when a company's making a lot of money, it's kind of hard to crack down on them. And of course, when they're making outside return, outsized returns, that's the first warning side you should be looking closely. But I also think you can't uh, specify levels of compensation, but some of these rules about time compensation to long-term performance, structural changes within the industry to be mandated, I think are very important. You'll see that a lot of this crisis was driven by the fact that people got paid at the moment enormous sums, notwithstanding the long-term outcome of what they did. A guy named Tom Maharis, who was head of the investment bank at Citigroup, got paid $94 million over three years for generating a ton of deals and fees for Citigroup. He got paid because he did that. Those deals lost close to $50 billion from the bank. So structural forms that basically change behavior, I think are gonna be as important as a stronger regulatory regime. But by the way, I, the, 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 I gotta say this, the Supreme Court has done enormous damage here, and I said it last night, between their Buckley decision that said rich people can spend what they want on their own campaigns, through the Citizen United decision, the equation of free speech and money has badly, badly, badly tilted uh, democratic outcomes in this country. And that's just something we have to slog uphill and to try to overcome. Thank you very much.